Now it's my privilege to uh, introduce Carrie hessler Radlett, the former director of the Peace Corps under the Obama administration. You might know that the idea of the Peace Corps was originally suggested by University of Michigan students to then presidential candidate Senator John F. Kennedy when he visited the University of Michigan campus. It began on October 14, 1960 at 2 a.m. in the morning on the steps of the Michigan Union where then Senator Kennedy gave an unprepared campaign speech challenging University of Michigan students to, vote, to devote a few years of their life working in developing countries around the world to promote better understanding between those countries and the United States. Within weeks, 1,000 University of Michigan students had signed a petition calling for the establishment of a Peace Corps program, and less than a year later, the Federal Peace Corps Agency was formed. So many thanks to Carrie for her leadership of the Peace Corps program more recently. And currently, Carrie is president and CEO of PCI, a nonprofit a governmental agency dedicated to empowering communities to enhance health, end hunger, and overcome hardship. Ladies and gentlemen, Carrie hessler Radlett. everyone. Can you hear me? Wow, I've been sitting back there and hearing all of you create those sounds. It's absolutely extraordinary. Thank you very much for making that experience come alive for us back there who couldn't see it actually in person. Um, it is wonderful to be here today. I thank you for getting up so early in the morning on the second day of a conference. I especially want to thank the students. I remember when I was a college student, it would have taken a lot to get me out of bed at 8 a.m. So... <laughs> I thank you for that, and I also thank Kelly for her incredible leadership here. It's very special to be at the University of Michigan, and Steve, thank you for your invitation. This is a special place for us, and in fact, the backstory on that was that it was actually the University of Michigan students, in fact, the head of the student body, who slipped JFK a little note as he was about to go on to the steps of the Michigan Union. And on that, it said, this is the demand of the University of Michigan students that you create an alternative to military service that can serve the cause of peace around the world. So actually, we owe the University of Michigan students a great debt. You know, I'm always excited to be at a Rotary event. I've been at Rotary events many times over my uh, now, well, I'm no longer at Peace Corps, but over the seven years that I was at the Peace Corps. And I come from a Rotary family. My father and my brother are Rotarians. My grandfather and my Aunt Ginny, both of whom also served in the Peace Corps, are Rotarians. And I was so honored to be... Um, inducted unofficially into Rotary as a Paul Harris Fellow a couple of years ago. So I feel an incredible connection to all of you. I have to say, and this is truth, that my father was more excited when I was pinned with the Paul Harris Fellow pin than he was when I got confirmed by the Senate to be director of the Peace Corps. <laughs> so anyway, that is the truth. <laughs> um, Rotary International and Peace Corps have a lot in common. You operate in all of the countries where Peace Corps operates, and then about 140 more, if you can imagine such a thing. Out in the field, our members have collaborated on projects in the areas of literacy, water and sanitation, health, and peace building at the last mile. And that's why it was such an obvious choice for us to create a partnership, a formal partnership, through the signing of a Memorandum of Understanding about two years ago. And that committed us to working together in the countries where we serve together. We pledged to join forces in our common efforts to inspire service across the country and around the world. And that includes collaboration overseas to share resources and expertise and to work together to boost the impact of our development efforts and to learn from each other. We're also working together domestically, helping Rotarians recruit new members from the return Peace Corps volunteers who come back. And also, we are recruiting very heavily for future Peace Corps volunteers among Rotarians, and you guys make really excellent 
Peace Corps volunteers. And I hear that the Rotaract, that several of the Rotaract students are also interested in Peace Corps, so I'm really excited about that. Thank you very much. Peace Corps and Rotary International are old friends, and today our members continue to work together to serve others and build peace at the ground level. One person, one community, one nation at a time. So today, I'm here to talk to you about the role of youth and women in building a more peaceful world. Now, I, because I'm from the Peace Corps, all of my examples are international, but I want you to think about the applications here domestically, because everything I say can also be applied right here at home. So I'm gonna start with a story. For years, the Kron women of Nimba County in northern Liberia kept their distance from the Mano and Gio neighbors. Bitter animosity kept them apart as ethnic tensions soared and the violence of the Liberian Civil War invaded their daily lives. Over time, the thunder of gunfire and the harassment by armed militiamen became almost normal in their lives, as did the absence of the men who had gone off to war or gone in search of jobs. But what really ravaged the soul was the ravaging of the young, the child soldiers who had never been to school, could not even write their name, and yet were trained to shoot and kill. Until one day it simply became too much. While the battles still raged on, pitting brother against brother, village against village, the women of Liberia came together. Young and old, Muslim and Christian, educated and illiterate, rich and poor, urban and rural. They hid their differences behind a white t-shirt that signified peace. They protested publicly at a field in Monrovia, the capital city, every day from dusk to dawn through a long, muddy, rainy season at great risk to themselves and their family. They shared food, exchanged stories, watched each other's children, and sang songs of protest against the brutal civil war, reaching out against formerly intractable ethnic boundaries to support each other's quest for peace. Finally, after many months, President Charles Taylor had no choice but to listen and to agree to peace talks. Shortly thereafter, the rebels also followed suit. The women demonstrated again outside the peace negotiations to hold their leaders, all of whom were men, accountable. And when egotism, vindictiveness, and distrust stalled the peace talks, the women surrounded the building. They locked arms and sent a note inside saying there would be no food, no water, no sex for the men conducting the deliberations until a peace agreement was signed. Within hours, a peace agreement was apparent. The women of Liberia brought peace to their nation. This is just one of many examples of women and adolescent girls, and there were many adolescent girls in the crowd, around the world acting locally, often spontaneously, reaching out across battle lines to demand peace. It is peacemaking at the village level, where the world's conflicts begin and end, where women and young people often take the lead in building inclusive communities and reconciling those who are scattered by hatred and devastation. But unfortunately, the contributions of young people and women to peace around the world, from Afghanistan to Zimbabwe, have been largely ignored. Rather, they've had to fight for a seat at the peace table and for recognition of their important role in both building and maintaining peace within their communities. Dismissed by governments and rebel movements alike, women are labeled as victims, not strong enough to play a serious role in the male business of war. Young people are labeled as extremists and are considered a threat to stability and development. But in reality, women and young people play an absolutely critical role in building peace at the last mile. As former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan has stated, women who know the price of conflict so well are also better equipped than men to prevent or resolve it. For generations, women have served as peace educators both in their families and in their societies, and they have proved instrumental in building bridges instead of walls. 
and about youth engagement and peace building, Kofi Annan has said, no one has bor is born a good citizen. No nation is born a democracy. Rather, both are processes that continue to evolve over a lifetime. Young people must be included from birth. A society that cuts off from its youth severs its lifeline. There are literally thousands and thousands of stories of women and young people who have stepped forward to nurture justice and serve the cause of peace, often at great danger to themselves. And this evidence has not gone unnoticed. On October 31st, 2000, the UN Security Council passed Resolution 1325, which formally recognizes women's special vulnerability in war and calls for their equal participation and full involvement in peacemaking and peace building. Yeah. And on December 19th, 2015, not very long ago, the Security Council unanimously adopted Resolution 2250, urging member states to consider ways to give youth a greater voice in decision making at the local, national, regional, and international levels. That is really worth applauding. But while Resolutions 1325 and 2250 may have strengthened young people's and women's claims to a seat at the peace table, they have not yet overcome the overwhelmingly, overwhelming political, cultural, and economic obstacles to their full participation, from the community level to the highest levels of government. By UN estimates, only 9% of the peace negotiators are women, and fewer than 1% are young people. So why is this important? Why must we bring women and young people to the peace table? Because in my opinion, it's the only way in which peace can be achieved in our fractured world. I believe that peace begins in our heart, in homes and families and workplaces and communities around the world. For every act of love, or conversely, every act of violence, is felt locally and is deeply personal to someone. In the words of JFK, our founder, Peace is a daily, a weekly, a monthly process, gradually changing opinions, slowly eroding old barriers, quietly building new structures. If we can accept that peace begins in our heart, then it stands to reason that each and every member of society, including young people, women, minority populations, and the disabled, must be included in the process of building open, loving, resilient communities and nation, nations where peace can thrive. And they must likewise be at the peace table where governments are held accountable for maintaining their commitments. Half of the world's population today is female, and more than half of the world's population today, more than half, is under the age of 30, with the vast majority living in developing countries. By keeping women and young people away from the peace table, we are excluding the majority of the world's people from formal participation in the peace process right off the bat. That does not make sense. So what do young people and women bring to the peace table? First, women bring wisdom and experience to the table, older women. Women are focused on their families and their children. They are the ones who educate their children and care for their families when they are sick. Evidence has shown that when women participate in civil society and politics, governments are more open, democratic, and responsive to their citizens. And when women are at the negotiating table, peace agreements are more inclusive and more long-lasting. For societies to thrive, Women and girls must have access to education, health care, and technology. They must have control of resources, land, and markets. They must have equal rights and equal opportunities as breadwinners, peace builders, and leaders. Young people bring energy and creativity and new ideas to the table. They challenge the status quo and think outside the box. They are at the cutting edge of social change positive social change if they are empowered and engaged, or conversely negative social change if they feel hopeless and, and excluded. They also must have equal rights and equal opportunities. They are our future. No one group has all the answers. 
by bringing together the energy and passion of young people and the experience and wisdom of women and men, new solutions can be created. So how do we bring young people and women to the peace table? In order for young people and women to take an equal stand in building peace, their voices must first be heard. And that's why I'm so excited that there are so many young people here today. And I really congratulate Rotary for making that a priority. They must have the skills to participate, and the research must focus on the results of their contributions. Very little research now focuses on the contributions of young people and women in the peace process. It's all about men. We must create places for women and youth to express their ideas and their opinions, and then we must really, truly listen to them. By giving them a voice, we empower them to use their skills and experience to make a difference. We must give youth and women the tools and training they need to be effective agents of change. And then we must give them opportunities to build their new skills so they can gain confidence to participate boldly in building a peaceful future from the ground up. By engaging young people and women actively and purposively in creating a culture of peace, we can change the paradigm. We can view the issue of security less as a military or police function and more as a responsibility of all of us. We can ensure that peace negotiations address not only the end of conflict, but also the development of programs to bring jobs, economic development, education, and health care to communities at risk. Resolutions 1325 and 2250 have helped to open the door to that future by recognizing women's and young people's unique suffering in war and their incredible contributions to peace. But on the difficult road from the battlefield to the conference table, women and youth peacemakers still have a long way to go. That said, women and young people from all walks of life are, conf are confronting conflict with peace in every region of the world. For example, women in Congo are bonding together to urge the government to end years of displacement impoverishment and sexual violence that has plagued their nation. They are standing up boldly. In Honduras, youth are using sports to bring together members of rival gangs to build trust and find common ground. In Afghanistan, women are demanding better access to schooling for girls and more effective protection of their rights. Israeli and Palestinian youth have joined forces and are working together as advocates for peace. And just miles from where we gather today, women in Detroit are reclaiming their neighborhoods from the gangs and drug lords that threaten their children. And young people are standing up against Islamophobia. Women and young people all over the world are reshaping their societies for good, demonstrating incredible courage and determination, and often at great odds, they are bringing peace to troubled lands. You know, I started my speech with the story of a group of determined women who brought peace to troubled Liberia. And I'm going to end now with the story that illustrates the impact that one young person can have on a community and how that community in turn changed his life. This is the story of Peter Chur, who is a Peace Corps volunteer. Peter was born in South Sudan. At the age of three or four, and he isn't sure how old he is, how old he was, his community was attacked by Islamic militants who burned down his village and murdered most of his family. Peter wandered in the bush with a band of boys between South Sudan, Ethiopia, and Kenya, always watching for and fearing the marauders who had scattered his family and left him orphaned. Yet he never lost hope. Eventually, after many years, the boys found their way to a UN refugee camp where Peter attended school for the very first time and he learned to read by tracing letters in the sand with a stick. He was incredibly bright and highly motivated and with the help of the United Nations, Peter eventually made his way to the United States as a refugee where he relentlessly pursued a GED and then earned a full scholarship to the University of Florida. After graduating with honors, he joined the Peace Corps in order to serve the United States, a country that he felt had given him so much. When Peter applied to the Peace Corps, he made only one request. 
he asked to go to a Muslim country because, in his words, he did not want to live his life fearing the people who shared the Islamic faith with those who had murdered his family. The only way he knew to seek reconciliation and learn to love Muslims was to live among them. Those are Peter's words. He wanted to learn to love and know Muslims. Peace Corps signed Peter to work in the country of Georgia among the minority Azeri people. These are Muslim refugees from Azerbaijan where many people were very suspicious of Americans and most had never ever seen a person of color. More than a million Azeris occupy a sliver of land next to the Georgian border with Iran. They remain there very much cut off from the Georgian society at large, and they have few job opportunities and limited access to health and education. An Azeri family in Peter's small village opened up their home to him and welcomed him as a son. And that was the beginning of Peter's long retreat from the anger and fear that had gripped him ever since his family was taken from him. He learned to love the Azeri people with whom he lived and worked each day, and they learned to love him. In Peter's words, what surprised me most was how human love and connection became stronger than my, family tragic, his, my tragic family history, my religion, my nationality as an American, and the color of my skin. Peter worked as a teacher in a school where more than half of the girls dropped out before completing their secondary school. That was the way things were when he arrived in their community. That was the way things always have been, he was told. Yet the more Peter delved into the Azeri culture, the more deeply he sought to understand the Islamic faith, the more he came to believe that there could be a different path forward for the girls who wanted an education. Peter's job was to teach, but he also saw himself as a student. He studied with the local mullahs, the Islamic religious leaders, he spent hours every evening learning the Azeri language and reading the Quran. He memorized their history and learned about their culture. He sat at the feet of the mullahs, got to know them very well, and asked them question after question. Peter knew that if he wanted to make a case for girls' participation in school, he would have to convince the mullahs. They were the key to influencing parents. So he studied the Quran even harder. He found passages that supported equal treatment of girls and boys. He practiced his Azeri language so he could present his arguments clearly and correctly. When Peter approached the mullahs about delaying marriage and letting their daughters stay in school, he offered not forceful arguments, but rather verses from the Quran. He helped the mullahs plan a series of community meetings to encourage parents to send their girls to school. In time, the number of girls in Peter's school came to equal the number of boys. Gender parity that could not be found in any other school in that region. Peter started an after-school boys and girls club to help his students improve their study skills and to practice leadership. Then, one day, a group of Peter's students approached him with sadness in, his eye, in their eyes. Some radical youth had slipped across the border from Iran and were promoting a violent, extremist, anti-American agenda. They were worried for Peter. They loved Peter. The radicals were saying that all Americans are CIA agents, intent on destroying their faith and all who adhered to its teaching. And they were recruiting for violent acts. Peter encouraged the students to speak to the mullahs and their own families about the extremists. And the mullahs and the families came together once again. And in that meeting, they told Peter that his service to their community was precious to them, and that because of, them, because of him, they knew that Americans are good people. They told Peter that he had earned their trust by being present with them in their community that Peter had shown them through his actions and through his words that he loved them. They would not allow any harm to come to him, nor would they allow those extremist views to be shared. 
together. Peter's students, their families, and the mullahs work together to drive the extremists from their community. They told them that their radical ideas would have no hold there. They told the extremists that they had experienced firsthand the love of an American through his dedication to their people. They told the extremists that they would never accept their radical views and that they would have no recruits from their community. Peter says about that experience, the best way to learn about the world and to make a difference is by being fearless in serving the cause of peace. His is a remarkable story of reconciliation and love and the courage it takes to find forgiveness and forge common ground. When faced with the devastating loss of his family and his childhood, Peter could have chosen anger and bitterness and fear. Instead, he chose purpose and activism and peace. Peter knew that the surest way to build peace in his new Azeri community was by humbling himself, listening and learning, and then empowering communities to create change. And his community loved him back, rejecting anger and hatred and embracing peace. At a time when our nation's focus is fixed on all that divides us, we at the Peace Corps and you at the Rotary have seen through our own work the finding common ground and fostering cooperation in the face of seemingly intractable differences is not just the best way forward, it is very often the only way forward. And we know that in order for peace to thrive, truly thrive, all members of society must be able to bring their best. Peace begins in our heart, and each and every one of us can do something to bring people together, to foster understanding, to build connections, relationships with people who are different from us, right here, wherever we are. Women and youth, in particular, deserve a seat at the peace table. It is the fastest way to create a peaceful world. Thank you. <laughs>